Okay, everybody, we're going to talk about earned income now as a revenue source. This is session 3.6. No, it's not. Okay, everybody, we're going to continue our conversations about revenue sources for nonprofits, and this time we're going to talk about earned income. From this, I want you to be able to demonstrate an understanding of unit economics and true costs um, when it comes to earned income for nonprofits. I want you to understand and apply what is called lean startup methods. And then we're going to talk about some common myths for socially conscious consumer behavior. So first, let's talk quickly about kind of the shift to earned income. This is a this is a principle we covered at the very beginning of the semester. Um, but but essentially, this is the reality of it. Private donations as a share of nonprofit revenue has have shrunk. Um, where it used to be about half of nonprofit revenue came from donations back in 1964. Um, now it's uh, the last time I've seen this measured uh, on a relative basis was 2011. And so you can see that donations as a share of nonprofit revenue have shrunk quite a bit. Uh, this is private donations, not including government grants and other things. Um, but during that time period, the reason the shift has happened is not because donations have gone down on a total number, but on a relative basis, and that's relative to earned income. Nonprofits, the nonprofit sector has grown dramatically because more earned income has helped fuel that growth. Um, it, it, earned income grew by 600% during this time period, and uh, it now accounts for over 70% of total nonprofit revenue, and for non-health related, like non-hospital nonprofit revenue, it's 43%, which is the largest single source of, of revenue for nonprofits. This trend is continuing to accelerate with the rise of social entrepreneurship that started a couple decades ago, where groups like these have, have pushed nonprofits and businesses uh, kind of together into this blended space. And the result is uh, more business models for social good. And there was a lot of concern over this, but research has shown that as nonprofits have increasingly relied on fees or earned income, uh, when you look at the good effects, the bad effects, and the sort of neutral or benign effects, what we see is that it, the, the earned income has helped nonprofits become more self-sufficient, it has helped strengthen their reputation in their communities. It's also helped them retain staff. If you remember, we talked about in session 3.3 how volatile private donations are as a revenue source. Well, if there's volatility there, usually the staff are the people who get cut when funding is cut. And if you have stable revenue in the form of earned income, then you don't have to worry about cutting your staff. And there really haven't been bad effects, despite the concerns that there would be bad effects as this shift was taking place over the last four decades. And things that have not been affected positively or negatively is it hasn't affected um, the ability to attract donors. It hasn't affected the ability to attract volunteers. It hasn't affected the ability for nonprofits to accomplish a mission or to find ways to improve their service delivery. And so nonprofits can keep being good at what matters to them as nonprofits um, despite uh, receiving earned income. Okay, so we're going to talk about some concepts that are important to understand. One of them is the idea of unit economics. And this is a really fundamental way to view any business. And it starts with this question, what do you produce and how much does it cost to produce? This is a fundamental reality, a, a source of gravity, really, for every business. Um, and we're going to talk through some nonprofits. I want you to come to class with some examples of nonprofits, and we're going to figure out what their unit is and then try to figure out how we would calculate their unit costs. So this is a little exercise we'll do together. Um, there are actually two different ways to calculate unit costs. Most organizations use the one on the left, the average total cost. And this is where you just take everything, every expense you have, and you average it across all of the units, whatever they are that you produce. So if each unit is a child in your program for one year, then um, you would take your total cost of everything you do divided by the number of children in your programs, and that would give you your average total cost. This is good and bad. It's bad in part because it considers fixed costs and then also sunk costs as a result. Um, we're going to talk about sunk costs a little bit. It also ignores marginal costs. It doesn't tell you how much one extra kid will produce because the marginal one extra kid in your in your program, how much that will cost. Um, but uh, because it, the marginal cost is actually probably cheaper to add one child, 
And but but uh, that's where marginal cost comes in. And so another way to think about unit costs is to think of how much it costs to produce one extra unit, or in this case, to 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 uh, involve one extra child in your programs. Um, and uh, and so we're going to talk about these a little bit together. Um, now we need to talk about the true costs. Now that we've talked about unit costs, we need to talk about the true costs that come with charities undertaking uh, activities like this. And there's a great Harvard Business Review article written by Foster and Braddock, who both work for, um, at the time they were working for uh, a nonprofit consulting group called Bridgespan. And they did this great study on a nonprofit in Kansas City. And at the time they wrote this article, there was a lot of pressure on nonprofits to engage in more business-like activities as part of the social entrepreneurship movement. And this study, they found their argument was that there's every reason to believe that most earned income ventures undertaken by nonprofits are, are, are not actually profitable. Now, this is in this context of nonprofits taking on businesses outside of their core activity, because obviously nonprofits have been relying on earned income for years um, prior to this research. But they use as a case study the example of a nonprofit in Kansas City that worked with troubled youth and a donor enamored by this idea of, of, of earned income as a sustainable resource, thought to themselves, hey, let's donate the resources to buy a commercial kitchen. And then the nonprofit can train the kids in the kitchen to make some food of some kind that the nonprofit then can then sell at a profit. So the organization agreed to this. And in fact, I think they were involved in pitching it to the donor. And so they produced... Uh, salad dressing. Uh, I use Newman's own because there's a story about I'll tell about them when we're in class together. Um, but the nonprofit uh, launched this salad dressing business made by kids, troubled youth who were learning uh, vocational skills. And they told everybody, they told the world that they were making 35 cents a bottle, but they weren't calculating true costs. They weren't thinking about all of the things that went into making this salad dressing business. And when you looked at just immediate cost, it turned out they were actually losing $7.18 per bottle of salad dressing. <laughs> if you looked at opportunity costs, it was actually costing them, and staff time and everything that went into that, it was actually, they were losing $86.50 per bottle of salad dressing. And the reasons for this was because they weren't pursuing it in a truly business-like fashion. They weren't thinking through all of the costs that went into this. Now, that doesn't mean that this is necessarily a bad activity. You know, it might be okay that this is happening because you're educating these kids and uh, vocational skills that could serve them well. But the point is the nonprofit thought that they were making 35 cents a bottle when they weren't. And there was a lot of subsidy happening and the concerns that the authors had about businesses like this here are in this bullet list on the left. And we're going to talk about that list together in class. If as a nonprofit you decide you want to take on a business model of some kind, the absolute best approach is the, the Lean Startup method. Now, uh, Lean Startup is a book that I highly recommend. Um, it's probably the most popular book out there on entrepreneurship right now, but I'm going to give you a quick summary of the Lean Startup method. And it's a very scientific approach to building something, uh, to building a business. You essentially start first with a hypothesis. It's an idea for the business that you think will work. And then there are three steps that you follow. The first is you build whatever it is that you plan to sell. And what, it, what you build is the simplest, cheapest, quickest version you can. The one that requires the least effort to get somebody to give you money. Um, uh, this is called in the startup world a, a, an MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product. And then you put that thing into the world and you measure. You put the product out there for feedback. You show it to people and get their feedback. You try to sell it to them and see how they respond to that. Um, and then once you put it out in the world, you're getting this feedback. Then you learn. You, you become a, you, it's important to be a great listener, to look for ways to improve the product for the next round. You update your hypothesis. And then you go again and you just do this cycle over and over and over and over again. And you go through this cycle as quickly as possible each time. So that way you can keep adapting and pivoting to respond to what the market needs. Um, this is not the way business used to be done. In entrepreneurship, the way it used to work is, is uh, entrepreneurs would build big, elaborate business plans. And then they would go convince uh, an investor to invest in their gigantic business plan. 
And uh, the research has shown that that is not a way to succeed. The way to succeed is this lean startup method where you just test as much as you can, as quickly as you can, and as cheaply as you can. Um, so I'll, I maybe can share some stories or other ideas that relate to this lean startup method. So now we're going to wrap up by talking about socially conscious consumers because there are a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, nonprofits think that because there's a social cause a attached to their product that they're trying to sell that it somehow will allow them to sell the thing at a higher price and that's not true. In fact, 50% of consumers claim they're willing to pay more for a socially responsible product and they're lying. I mean, they don't know they're lying, but in practice they're lying because it doesn't manifest itself in their actual purchase behavior. We'll talk about Ben and Jerry's a little bit because they're an example of a of a of a for-profit business with socially responsible significance. Um just uh, some truths to this that come out of the research. Consumers are, first of all, rarely consider social value before functional value. If your product isn't as good as everything else on the shelf, they're just not even going to bother. They'll only pay more for social value if the functional attributes of whatever are, su are sufficient, meaning if your product is slightly worse than everything else, there's no way they're going to pay a premium for your product. Um, and for most products, consumers are unaware of the social significance. Ben & Jerry's is actually a great example because they are ethically sourced. Um, they engage in philanthropy. They do all kinds of beneficial things. But most people who buy Ben & Jerry's have no idea about the issues that the company that drive the, the way the company does business. So the lessons for this are to be sure that the product or service ties closely to the social issue. Um, uh, I'll give you some examples of bad versions of this. Don't believe surveys of, of consumers. They will, they will tell you that they're willing to pay more, but they are not. In fact, um, if you have social benefits to your product, they have to be communicated very quickly and simply, and you can't guilt people or force people into social responsibility. It simply does not work. So that's it. We're going to have some time for you guys to look at their earned income strategies of the nonprofits you've chosen for your report and some time to talk about other examples from this content. I'll see you in class.